this, but you'll just remember how to interpret, hopefully. That's the goal here, all right? So here's the scenario. As part of the new transcript at our school, the counselors have decided to include IQ score as an addition to, in addition to GPA. Will knowing your GPA help predict the IQ? That's what we want to know. So the IQ scores of Adam, Deja, and Eldon are recorded. 85, 120, and 105, but they are mixed up. We don't know whose goes with who. Wonderful, right? Your job is to predict an IQ score for each student and minimize the error that we make. All right, so there's a couple methods here. If we use the first method, the method says use the mean of the three IQs, all right? So when I average the three IQs, I get an X bar of 103.3. So if that's what we're using to predict their IQs, I'm going to put that in my prediction box, 103.3. Now, if I magically now know what their true IQs are, you see Adam was an 85, Deja was 105, and Eldon is 120. So now, if I wanted the error, how would I find the error? Same as, Same as residual, yep. So it's actual minus predicted. So 85 minus 103 is going to be a negative 18.3. 105 minus 103 is a positive 1.7. 120 minus 103.3 is 16.7. And then we square it because it's a distance, right? And we would do 349.69, 2.89, 278.89. And then sum of the errors squared, so we add these straight down, and we get 631.47. That's a lot of error. Squared. Now, let's try a different method. Say for some reason we have a regression line of their IQs and their GPAs. Somehow we got it. So we're going to use, see if we can use GPA as a predictor of the IQ. So if I plug in that GPA of 1.8 into this equation, what do I get? Well, the prediction comes out to be for Adam, 84.08. For Deja, it comes out to 109.84. And for Eldon, it came out to 116.28. So we found those by pre plugging in the GPAs into that equation. Now remember, we somehow magically know their true IQs. This was the 84, Deja was 105, and Eldon was 120. So we're going to do the same thing with the errors. Actual minus predicted. So 85 minus 84.08 gives me 0.92. Gives me negative 4.84. And this one gives me 3.72. When I square them, 0.8464. Twenty three point four two five six thirteen point eight three eight four and then when I add them up thirty eight point one one oh four. All right. A lot of math there, right? Now, which method would be better to use? The what? The regression one. The regression line, the second method, and why is that? Less error. Yeah. Method two, there is less error. Right? Less error. Well, that's what we want. We want good predictions, which means we want less error if possible. Now, now it's asking us to calculate the improvement from the original two method, like original one. Method one, method two. So what we're going to do is take that original error, 631.47, and we're going to subtract the new error, 38.1104. Don't worry, I have it figured out. 
over the original. When I do, I get 0.93. Now, what does this tell me? This is what we call R squared. And the way we interpret this is we're going to make it a percentage. And we're going to say 93% of the error is explained. Or you could say accounted for by our new method, which is pretty good, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you say? We accounted for most of our error. That's a pretty good scenario. Now, now's the time to click up on your calculator and look at that output, all right? Oh, wait. Nope, wrong output. Sorry. This is this one. If I find the correlation and the coefficient determination for this data set, I'll tell you what it is. R comes out to be 0.9686. So what do you suppose R squared is going to be? It's going to be this 0.9686 squared. It actually comes out to 0.9382. So it gets us to this equation without all that work, or it gets us to that value, I should say, okay? So that's the nice thing, and now we have these fancy calculators that actually spits out R squared and R for us, all right? Now, the other thing that's newish is the standard deviation of the residuals, okay? Now, if you need to know the calculation, it looks like this. You're not going to have to calculate it, thankfully. Uh, it's going to be the sum of your errors squared divided by n minus 2. So if a sum of the errors squared is 38.1104, n was 3 people minus 2, so it's really just 1, right? And this comes out to 6.17. And that's the typical error. And I'll give you the sentence on this one in a second. Okay. Now, like I said, they're going to give you S either in table format or in the question. You don't have to remember how to calculate it. But if you're interested, that's what's happening here. Okay. Okay. So let's look at this. All right. Standard deviation of the residual, starting where we left off. Here's how we would interpret this. The actual y in context, of course, is typically about s, whatever that standard deviation number is, away from the number predicted by the regression line. I like to add on there where x is equal to whatever it is, so that you have both variables in your statement in context. I believe LSRL is, a, is an acceptable abbreviation as long as you've got the x and the y context in there. Okay. Now, that R squared business, all that stuff, R squared is also known as coefficient of determination. All right. I know it's a long wordy, I don't know why, doesn't mean R at all, but whatever. That's what it is. So when we interpret R squared, we're going to make that R squared value a percent. Okay? First thing we do is make it a percent. And we say about, for instance, 93% of the variability in the context. The, for instance, the IQ is accounted for by the regression line. Again, I would say where X is equal to whatever the context is. So, how can we find R squared if we know R? Just square it. Just square it, right? Just square it. Don't overthink it, just square it. So, how can we find R if all we know is R squared? Square root it. But, Something you got to be careful of. Remember with the square root, it could be positive or negative because of the absolute value thing. 
How could we know if it's positive or negative? Just look at the graph. Look at the graph. Look at the equation. You're looking at the slope, right? So check slope for positive or negative on your R. Because when we square it, we can't tell anymore, right? So keep that in mind. Now, here's the same example we were just doing on our previous simulation, thankfully. Um, there's the regression line right up below. We already did that, right? Now you look at your screen and find and interpret R squared. So what does your output tell you that R squared is? Uh, is 0 0.841. 0 0.841, okay. That's what the, computer, or the calculator gave me, right? So now I have to interpret that. So the first thing I want to do is make this a percentage. So I would say about 84.1% of the variability in, okay, what is our response variable in this, qu this question? No, nope. city fuel economy is our x variable. Be the highway fuel economy is our response variable. We're using city fuel economy to predict highway. Is that with me? Okay. So, 84% <clears throat> uh, of the variability in the highway fuel economy is accounted for. by the LSRL where X is equal to the city fuel economy. Hello. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll send her down in a minute. Uh-huh. Bye. <clears throat> all right, is that all right? Follows the model every single time you change your context to fit. Now it says to find and interpret the value of R. Well, your calculator gave it to you, didn't it? It's just the square root of R. And now would it be positive or negative? It's positive. It's positive. We know that because of the equation we've already written down, right? In our previous one, we had this. Oh, it's a four. So y is uh... okay. So we know that now to interpret R. Do you remember how to do that? That's way before the break. Circle the dots. We don't have the dots, though, do we? <laughs> so <clears throat> when we interpret just R, all you have to do is, is direction, strength, and context. Direction, strength, and context. Well, we know it's positive. How would you describe the strength on this? Very strong. And we can throw context in there, right? So we would say the relationship... between city and highway fuel economy is strong and linear, right? And then lastly, there's S. They tell us what S is. We just got to use our sentence structure to interpret it. <clears throat> so we would say the actual response variable is my highway fuel economy. Highway fuel economy is typically 
about 2.786 what? What unit would go on this? Miles per yeah, miles per gallon, good. Miles per gallon <coughs> away from the number predicted by the LSRL where x is equal to the city fuel economy.